Kelvin Hepner with Real Agriculture. We're at the Manitoba Agronomist Conference and uh, pleased to be joined by Lana Shaw with the Southeast Research Farm at Red Rivers, Saskatchewan. And Lana, you've been doing, anybody who follows you on Twitter especially knows that you've been doing a, a ton of research in the area of intercropping on the prairies. And there's certainly growing interest in intercropping and cover cropping and relay cropping and companion cropping. Is that almost all of them? Yes. Uh, <laughs> If for a producer looking to to get into it for the first time, I think it's it it can be overwhelming or, or seem very complicated. Where do you recommend a, a producer start when they when they get into it? First of all, um, I think first off, right now, the uh, is to get on Twitter. Um, it might sound strange to a lot of farmers that that this is a way of getting agricultural information right now, but this is where our cutting edge is right now, where the producers and the researchers are connecting in order to share information. Mm -hmm. So um, some of the people that have taken an interest in intercropping have made a point of connecting with those farmers and researchers using social media. There are other ways you can do it, but that's one of the fastest ways of finding out who is involved in this. And uh, also being able to see pictures of what their crops have looked like or you know they'll talk about you know some of their challenges through the year and you know for a lot of them it's bragging rights so of you know th look at my crop and you know they're so excited about it so you start to catch on to some of the enthusiasm and excitement that you know the people that are already intercropping have so you are absorbing information over a period of time and it, it might be this winter you make it an objective to absorb as much information as you can before next spring. In general, the advice that I've heard that I would give people and to, um, that other people, intercroppers, have suggested is to start small. Pick a fairly easy intercrop that's easy to separate and start with one field. And that's how most of these intercroppers have started. You don't have to commit all of your acres or a quarter of your acres to intercropping in order to start it. You can start with one field and that way um, you, you try to learn as much as you can, have a plan before you start, have your separating equipment planned before you start, and then um, and go from there. Uh, make adjustments for your local area, make adjustments for your equipment based on um, how things go after that point. But yes, the, for equipment and um, the crop selection, it's dependent on what you have and what your land is like. So what works in Lethbridge is not likely to work in Manitoba. Mm -hmm. That's okay. It doesn't mean intercropping it won't work. It just means you have to be more careful about how you're um, choosing your intercrops and how you're growing them. So there, there's no simple recipe on how to do it. Uh, but it, this, this is something that can be worked out. Where it's kind of like we're designing intercrops for specific locations. Mm -hmm. And yes, people can contact me. I answer lots of questions on this. Okay, that was going to be my next question. Do we start with peas and canola or a, a lentils and, and mustard combo? But that really depends on what is best for your area. Yes, so a rule of thumb that I'm going with at the moment is if you're in... Um, let's say you're you're in lentil country maybe you can do a chickpea flax right normally you're not in chickpea area if you're you can grow peas reliably um, if you're a little bit outside of the lentil area you may be able to grow an intercrop lentil uh, so there's so the area of adaptation for some of these crops does change a little bit as you intercrop them but but not dramatically so so you know Manitoba is not going to be probably intercropping chickpeas and flax but it you know it may change the area of adaptation by a few hundred miles so there are um, you know a number of options that people can look at in general yes the easiest ones tend to be some kind of pea with an oil seed of you know usually a brassica because um, the peas are pretty competitive. A lentil, you have to be quite careful on the seeding rate of, of an oil seed you put with it because you don't want to seed one lentil and get five back. That would not be, you would not see that as a successful intercrop. Even if you had a lovely crop of, say, mustard, you still wouldn't be very happy with your lentils in that case. So, you know, I'm in the infancy of trying to figure out how, what are the 
optimum kind of mixes and designs for intercrops for various regions. But yes, definitely they're they're regional. Okay. So in terms of managing an intercrop, do you prioritize one of the crops over the others in terms of, of seeding date or harvest date or, or different management approaches to it? I think that's a good strategy okay. because um, I, I think it makes more sense, and a lot of the farmers are finding this, that it makes more sense to have at least 75% of your harvested product being a single crop, oftentimes your pulse crop, and have an oil seed as your supporting actor because it's easier to separate a, a um, crop where the large seed is the predominant thing in the mix you're basically dealing with a high dockage situation instead of like a 50 50 mix also the fifth once you're in a 50 50 category sometimes you can it can swing wildly either way where you thought you were going to have a 50 50 crop and you ended up with just canola or just peas and um, in terms of forward pricing that could be a big problem. So I think in most of the time people want to have a reasonable idea of what they're going to get at the end of the year. And so by designing seeding rates um, and adjusting your seed, your seed timing and your harvesting timing to optimize your main crop, um, hopefully you're having a less risky outcome. Mm -hmm. In terms of, of risk, I guess you, you mentioned the the less predictable nature of, of contract forward contracting the grain. Another financial aspect would be in terms of the cost would be having ensuring you have the, the cleaning capabilities after harvest. That would be one of the only, I guess, financial investments in, in getting into intercropping or no? Um, seeding equipment can be a financial investment. In, in Most of the time we're trying to um, put this down in one pass, okay. but a lot of the time that can be not a huge financial outlay in order to to have the extra plumbing necessary or an extra tank necessary in order to seed. The seed cleaning is not a large cost in terms of, you know, having a basic, when you're looking at some very basic um, dockage cleaner type capacity, rotary grain cleaners. Yeah. So on a cost per bushel, it's not very large, but it's something that yes, you need to plan for ahead of time. Just, I guess, trying to understand what the, the downside risk is in, in trying, in and getting into it. Another thing that can be a possible, that we don't know yet, is how long you can store those grains that are mixed. Okay. Ideally, you're separating them at harvest time, but obviously that has challenges. You may not have the time to be able to deal with this at harvest. So um, that's something that is currently uh, a t subject of interest to PAMI and us to be able to get a handle on it. But the experience has been if, the, if both crops in the, in the mix are dry in their own right, that that's stable uh, for quite a while into the fall. But if you throw some air on it and cool it down, that's gonna reduce risk. But you manage that as you would a high dockage grain and be careful with them. All right. Finally, getting back to, to Twitter, people can, what's, what's your handle on Twitter? How can people find you? A Southeast or SE underscore research farm. Um, it's on my Twitter, it says Lana at Southeast Research Farm. So it's, yes, it's the Research Farm's account, but I take some liberties in, in being rather excited. It's not a well-kept secret at all that I do a lot of intercropping at the Research Farm and I talk about our trials a lot. And it's fun to be able to go out to, uh, into our trials and take pictures and, and show the, what yeah. those look like. In real time, that's the other thing, you're sharing yes. this information quickly, yeah. yeah. 50,000 acres is the, the estimate for what Saskatchewan had this year. What do you think? Is that's the potential, or, or where, where's it going from there? That's my estimate for this year. Uh, that's been inc almost doubling, I think, ev the, for the last several years. So we could be at 10,000 acres next year. Be, I think the... the 100,000, right? Or 100,000 yeah. acres yeah. next year. Uh, I think the, the what's happening with the herbicide-resistant weeds, mm -hmm. Uh, root rots, you know, people under pressure as far as their rotations and being able to figure out how to make things pay right now is driving this need. The necessity being the mother of invention. I'm not convincing people to intercrop. I'm just trying to keep up with the people that are. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks for taking the time, Lana. Thanks. Cool.